Welcome to our first ever guest of diagnosis event. And here we go. So this is a poll. Which of the following best describes you? Are you a pre-dental student or a non-dentist? Are you a dental student or a medical student? Are you a resident, be it dental or medical? And are you a practicing dentist, dental specialist, or healthcare professional? Pick the option that best suits you and how you would describe yourself. It may not be a perfect match, but pick the option that best suits you. There is no right answer. There are no points awarded. It's just so that we know who's here and who's hanging out with us this evening. All right. So plenty of pre-dental students, a few practicing dentists and specialists. Let's see how it pans out. Here is our first graded question. It is a quiz. What mnemonic can help diagnose this lesion? And here we have it. We have a lesion in the posterior mandible that has different little edges to it. Is it Mr. Sleep? Is it macho? Is it PEMDAS? Or is it ABCDE? Mnemonics are a learning device, a way for us to remember certain topics, and there is a helpful way to remember this lesion. Let's, uh, let's turn off the ability to draw. I think that that might help annotate, clear. All right. So the correct answer is macho. And just a reminder as to what macho is. Ma oh, here we go. We got to see. Look at this. We have an early lead. We have Maddie taking an early lead. All right. But the game is still very tight. Look at this. We've got a tight game. Some, some people fast on the trigger here. So what is macho? It is the differential diagnosis for a large radiolucency in the posterior mandible. If you want a refresher after the game, there's a pretty good YouTube channel for oral pathology. It is run by myself, Stephen Roth, S-T-E-P-H-N-R-O-T-H. Had to put a plug in. But macho stands for myxoma, adenogenic myxoma, ameloblastoma, central giant cell granuloma, hemangioma, and adenogenic keratocyst. You can also rearrange the letters to make mocha, but it is much too late for caffeine. So we'll, uh, we'll be big and macho for our game and we'll strut our stuff. All right, on to number two. The lesion in that picture was a central giant cell granuloma. What are we going to see under the microscope? Here are four microscopic images. One of them was taken from this case. The other three are not. They are other lesions that are hiding. So which would represent a central giant cell granuloma? Is it the red triangle? Is it the blue diamond? The orange circle or the green square? Where are our giant cells? Let's see how you did. Great, 15 people got it. Uh, just as a little histology lesson here, the red is a schwannoma. You can see the Antony A pattern here where we've got palisaded cells, nothing, and then more palisading. This is a squamous cell carcinoma in the blue diamond with a keratin pearl. The orange circle is viral cytopathic effect with molding and multinucleation and margination of chromatin on the nuclei of these cells infected by the herpes simplex virus. And 15 of you got the correct answer. These little chocolate chip cookies are the giant cells that are seen in a central giant cell granuloma. Oh, Maddie, crushing it again, holding on to her lead with a shakeup in second place, a shakeup in second place. All right. On to the next. What syndrome is not associated with central giant cell granulomas? This is a not question. Is it Gardner syndrome, neurofibromatosis, cherubism, or Noonan syndrome? This is a lovely picture from this case of a giant cell lesion, which has quite a bit of blood. It's a, a bloody background. It looks like steak when cut. 
we've got our chocolate chip cookie giant cells mixed in a fibrous background with extravasated blood. We've got one second left and let's see how we did. Gardner syndrome is the correct answer. This one stumped people a little bit. Yeah. So Gardner syndrome is associated with osteomas or hard bony structures that uh, can be seen in the skull. Believe it or not, the uh, neurofibromatosis can be associated with central giant cell granulomas. Cherubism, the hallmark is central giant cell granulomas. And Noonan syndrome, which is a pretty uncommon, is also associated. All right. Maddie, crushing it today, crushing it today. We've got a complete upheaval of second and third place, though. So uh, is, can anyone dethrone Maddie? Maybe not. We, she, uh, she's been taught well. All right. What systemic condition must be ruled out in this patient, especially with the following neck findings? So what is the neck finding? It is a little lump right here. Is this hypoparathyroidism, hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, or hyperthyroidism? This is a image of the neck in an axial view. We've got our larynx here. What systemic condition must be ruled out in a patient with a central giant cell? Very good, hyperparathyroidism. Central giant cell granulomas in the context of hyperparathyroidism are known as brown tumors, which is not eponymous, meaning it's not named after anybody, but it is because it looks brown. All central giant cell granulomas look brown when they are grossed or examined in whole, uh, and then you cut them open and they look like steak, it's real gross. But hyperparathyroidism and brown tumors, which are central giant cell granulomas in this context must be ruled out. In this patient, that lesion that you saw was a parathyroid adenoma, which led to excess parathyroid hormone, which led to the brown tumors. All right, a tough one. Let's check that leaderboard. All right, we've got a, a rat race here. It is, it is been being shaken up. All right, get your hands on the trigger here. Get your hands on the trigger. We've got our next question, number five. Name that tooth anomaly. Is it a mesiodens? Is it a paramolar? Is it a dens evaginatus? Or is it a distomolar? It is a paramolar. Mesiodens most commonly occur in the midline of the maxilla. Dens evaginatus is going to appear as an excess little tubercle in the central groove of usually a premolar. And then distomolar is going to be behind that third molar and is sometimes called a fourth molar. This is a paramolar, which often occur occurs uh, lingually or buccally to the premolars or the first molar. This patient had bilateral paramolars which is uh, relatively common, but it happened in this patient. Maddie is crushing it. The rest, we've got a, a real contest though for second and third place, a real contest heating up for second and third place. All right. Burton's line indicates what kind of toxicity? Is it arsenic? Is it lead? Is it silver or is it gold? Silver and gold, that was a, uh, a song in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So this is a, a seasonally appropriate question, but this is a Burton's line in this patient. This is a case taken from the New England Journal of Medicine. And we'll talk about it once all of the answers are in, which is in two seconds. What is the answer? It is lead. Burton lines occur in the gingiva of patients with lead poisoning and lead toxicity. 
What occurs is that lead makes it into the gingival sulcus, which is then digested by the bacteria that occur in that uh, gingival sulcus and create this discoloration and this staining. This case was in the New England Journal of Medicine Image uh, Challenge, and it was in a patient that chews opium. And I don't happen to do illegal drugs, but my understanding is that illegal drugs are sold by weight. So this opium was uh, cut with lead to make it heavier. So the patient was getting less opium that they paid for and more lead and it weighed more. So they were paying for the lead and ended up with lead toxicity. There was more than just the Burton line, including systemic effects uh, for this patient. I do recommend reading that in the New England Journal of Medicine. It is a Burton line, lead toxicity. All right. We got a hot streak for uh, for Dr. Appa here, a hot streak for Dr. Appa, really quick on the trigger. The really excited cat with spots is coming into the third, really happy to see on that leading, leading leaderboard there. Uh, and we have a new front runner. We are coming up to the halfway point here, coming up on the halfway point. Let's see what we've got for our next question. What is your top clinical concern for this patient? Are you worried about an osteosarcoma, a pheochromocytoma? Are you worried about brittle bones or cafe au lait macules? What are you worried about in this patient? You know, it's uh, an interesting looking teeth here, maybe a little opalescent, if that is ringing any bells for you. Maybe a little hint with the last uh, one second of, of question answering here. Absolutely brittle bones. So this is the opalescent teeth seen in osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, and so you have to worry about patients breaking their bones. In this patient, this patient was actually born with broken bones and we'll see a radiograph from when the patient was two years old. Osteosarcomas uh, can occur in patients with, with osteogenesis, but it's by no means a common finding. Pheochromocytoma is a adrenal gland tumor and it is very commonly seen in a wide variety of syndromes, but not in osteogenesis imperfecta. And then cafe au lait macules is also not seen in osteogenesis imperfecta, but seen in McCune Albright, neurofibromatosis, and many others. Let's see those scores get tallied. Dr. Appa taking a resounding lead. And let's take a look at that patient. So this is the patient at two years old and you're actually looking at the patient's femur with a, a break. Uh, this patient was wheelchair bound by the time that I examined them and saw the opalescent teeth. That is characteristics of uh, osteogenesis imperfecta or in the absence of bony findings, dentinogenesis imperfecta. We are at the halfway point. So I do wanna thank you all for tuning in to our very first ever uh, first ever Zoom uh, Kahoot challenge for diagnoses. We do hope that you're all having a good time, maybe learning a thing or two, and uh, we're excited to give out some cash prizes. We are hoping to do this again in the future. So st stay tuned, tell everyone how much fun you had, and let's keep on keeping on. All right, what is the causative agent for myospherulosis. And here is a photomicrograph from the case that I saw. Is it a fungal infection, a bacterial infection, an adonogenic neoplasm, or petrolatum medicament? This is a endangered species. We don't see this too often anymore, but it is something that we've come across. This is an image that we came across uh, during my time as a resident. All right, so this was a toughie. Myospherulosis is actually secondary to petrolatum medicament. What happens is uh, back in the day when dentists were concerned about dry socket, they would create an antibiotic paste using petrolatum as the base, as the carrier for the medication. They would then put it in an extraction socket, which with gauze, and the gauze would often get left behind in addition to this petrolatum and this medication, and it would appear as a radiolucency. 
after the radiolucency was explored, we'd look at it under the microscope and see these tiny black round dots. These tiny black round dots look similar to fungal species, which is why they have a fungus sounding name and how 13 of you got tricked because maybe you've never heard of this. It certainly sounds fungal because many people thought it looked fungal under the microscope when really it was just remnants from a um, a way to prevent dry socket and in treating bacteria. So let's see how many people knew this very difficult and challenging question. What's going to happen to the leaderboard? Oh, look at that. The top people in the leading leaderboard. It seems like no one really got that up at the top, but Harneet, Harneet coming up strong. That's great. All right. What medication is this patient most likely taking? Calcitonin, cyclosporin, allopurinol, or hydroxychloroquine? What medication is this patient taking? And I actually did just see a patient with this condition on this past Monday. And this patient was actually taking the medication. That is the answer. And the answer is cyclosporin, which is a um, anti-inflammatory medication often used in patients with transplants. My patient had had a kidney transplant, which is why he was on the cyclosporin. Other medications also cause gingival hyperplasia, including nifedipine and other calcium channel blockers, and phenytoin and certain anti-seizure medications are among the kind of leading offenders. They do have an additive effect. So my patient was on cyclosporin and nifedipine and his gingival hyperplasia was pretty remarkable, way worse than the picture that I used in this question. Allopurinol would be a good guess, but that often causes a lichenoid medication reaction as opposed to a gingival hyperplasia. The calcitonin was to throw you off. That's often seen as a circulating marker of medullary thyroid carcinoma. And hydroxychloroquine is also an anti-inflammatory, but it often caused gingival pigmentation as opposed to uh, gingival hyperplasia. Ooh. Maddie back in the lead with Jill coming into third place. We've got an entire new three, four, and five on the last round with a switch at the top. It is anyone's game. Fingers on the trigger. We've got plenty of questions left. Let's see how we do. Which of the following is a possible diagnosis for this dorsal tongue lesion? Is this epithelial dysplasia, peripheral odontogenic fibroma, Granular cell tumor or dentigerous cyst? What is the most possible diagnosis for this tongue lesion? The uh, contributor here circled it for us in case we missed it. That was very kind of them to do. Uh, but it is this little nodule here on the dorsal of the tongue. And let's see how we did. Granular cell tumor, great, absolutely. You want to think about a, a granular cell tumor whenever you see a bump on the dorsal tongue. There certainly are other things that can enter, enter the differential diagnosis, but epithelial dysplasia is going to be surface change. And in that lesion, you can appreciate that the surface was actually elevated. You could still see the taste buds over the lesion. The surface itself wasn't changed, but underneath the surface was. So we have to be thinking about something that can happen underneath the surface. Peripheral odontogenic fibroma only occurs on the alveolus or the bone that holds the teeth. And then dentigerous cyst only occurs with an impacted tooth. So uh, peripheral odontogenic fibroma and dentigerous cyst does not occur outside of the jaws. And then epithelial dysplasia, we're looking for surface change. So the only correct answer would be granular cell tumor. Other possible items on the differential diagnosis include a neurofibroma, neurofibroma, a schwannoma. You can start to think about other things like salivary gland lesions, uh, but you really want to think about a granular cell tumor whenever you see a kind of yellow doughy lesion on the dorsum of the tongue. All right, we've got a new second place, Jill Grant in second. Look at this, crushing it, crushing it. All right, can we see? Uh, Lynn is the highest climber, climbed up six places on that last question. Way to go, Lynn. 
And here is a photomicrograph from that case. Granular cell tumors have a very easy name because the cells themselves happen to be granular. You can appreciate that it looks like they are filled with little tiny grains of sand. The uh, origin of these cells are a little controversial. We don't know exactly their origin, but this does stain with a stain called S100. S100 stain cells of the neural crest, often nerves and uh, their components. So a lot of people thought that this was a neural lesion. Many people thought that this looks like muscle. So they were wondering if these were skeletal muscle precursors. And to this day, we don't really know. So we call it granular cell tumor. Name that diagnosis. Benign migratory glossitis, epithelial dysplasia, pseudomembranous candidiasis, and coated tongue. And believe it or not, I get a lot of patients with this presentation, and I have heard all four of these things as the suggested diagnosis from the clinician. However, this presentation is classic and slam dunk for one of them, and the other three are wrong. So hopefully you get this right. It's okay if you don't, we'll learn something tonight, and hopefully you'll know the next time you come across it, because it is pretty common. This is geographic tongue or benign migratory glossitis. It is not epithelial dysplasia, which is going to be a uniform change that you're going to see with the sharply demarcated border. Pseudomembranous candidiasis are going to be little white plaques that can be wiped away and aren't going to have this sort of serpiginous rounded border with deep appellation or redness of the tongue. Coated tongue is going to be uniform white change as opposed to the red white change that we are seeing in this. This is classic geographic tongue. Nothing. Nothing, but Riri did go up six places. So uh, congrats to, to Riri. When are you gonna drop the next album? Just, just need to know. All right. What condition has an association with benign migratory glossitis? Granulomatosis with polyangiitis, Melchor and Rosenthal syndrome, systemic lupus erythematosus, or reactive arthritis? Which of these is the correct answer sometimes associated with benign migratory glossitis or geographic tongue? One of these is, three of them are not, which will it be? Benign migratory glossitis, geographic tongue, final answers. The answer is reactive arthritis, a tough one. So granulomatosis with polyangiitis is the artist formerly known as Wegner's granulomatosis. That can present as a hole in the palate uh, but it does not present, or strawberry gingivitis, but not as with geographic tongue. Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome is facial palsy with uh, orofacial granulomatosis or swollen lips and fissured tongue, but not geographic tongue. It is true that geographic tongue and fissured tongue are sometimes seen in tandem, but they are uh, not, geographic tongue is not a part of Melkerson Rosenthal. Systemic lupus erythematosus uh, will look similar to lichen planus, but reactive arthritis, also known as writer's syndrome, is sometimes associated with benign migratory glossitis. And we've got uh, an input from the chat, and it's a, a friendly reminder that 576 is the page in the uh, CBSE book that you'll need to turn to in order to, to give you that answer that reactive arthritis, the eponymous name is Reiter syndrome. We uh, try to avoid eponyms as much as we can, but that is the answer. All right, final stretch. We're coming down to the last three questions here. Who's gonna bring it home? We've got Dr. Dr. Appa still up top, let's see. No change? Oh, wow, our top five missed this question. But NN, whoever NN is, I don't know if they're just real smart and they know their syndromes uh, or they had a lucky guess there with reactive arthritis, but it looks like they were one of the two people that got that question right. The mnemonic, by the way, for reactive arthritis is can't see, can't pee, and can't climb a tree. They uh, have uh, conjunctival lesions, conjunctivitis. They have uh, urethritis, non-bacterial urethritis, and then they have the arthritis. 
this is often secondary to an STI. So about two weeks after clearance of the STI, they get the can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. And maybe geographic tongue. What condition does this patient likely have? What is this? This is characteristic for this condition. Is it sarcoidosis? Is it Crohn's? Is it ulcerative colitis? Or is it lichen planus? We've got some classic lesions here. This is one of many different presentations of one of these conditions. But when you see this, you got to think about Crohn's. These are linear fissures in the vestibule that look like snail tracks. When you see linear fissures in the vestibule, you got to think about Crohn's. Other things associated with Crohn's are orofacial granulomatosis or swelling of the lips, usually upper lip, but sometimes lower lip. And also, believe it or not, aphthous ulcers. Now, aphthous ulcers can happen in any person, as I'm sure you know, but they can be seen in a wide variety of systemic conditions as well, including Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But Crohn's, these snail track lesions and the linear vestibule, these linear fissures are pretty darn specific for Crohn's. Oh, we've got a new gold and silver medal. We've got a, a battle here at the top, but it's anyone's game. All it takes is one of these three to miss it and somebody else to get it. Eli just jumped up six places. He, uh, he just reviewed his crone, so that's excellent. And we're coming down to the penultimate question, question number 14, the second to the last question here. Name that diagnosis. And we're looking specifically here and here and here. And here, is it geographic tongue, aphthous stomatitis, recurrent intraoral herpes simplex, or coated tongue? And we're looking for the main diagnosis here. What is abnormal? And let's see if I can draw a little thing here. We're looking at this guy and this guy and that guy or girl, either way. Very good, aphthostomatitis. This is classic aphthostomatitis, which is a yellow fibroporulent membrane surrounded by an erythematous halo. We just looked at geographic tongue, so of course I'm not gonna ask about that again. Recurrent intraoral herpes simplex, that often occurs on the bound mucosa. So we're talking about the palate and the, uh, and the alveolus where the teeth are. That is in immunocompetent patients. Now, of course, immunocompromised patients can get recurrent intraoral herpes simplex outside of that context. But really, when you're look, thinking about recurrent intraoral herpes, you want to think about gingiva. Uh, this is aphthostomatitis far and away. You've got that classic fibroperulent membrane and erythematous halo surrounding it. All right. Going into the final question. Let's see how we did. Oh, Michael Appa, how the, how the mighty have fallen here. All right, so here are our standings going into our last question. And uh, again, I did just wanna thank everyone for coming out. This was uh, a little experiment. I know that I've had quite a bit of fun tonight. I hope that all of you had to nerding out to us. Um, be sure to stay tuned uh, both with the top, uh, with student dental, remind me, top dental professionals, uh, students of dentistry, and all of the Instagram accounts to see about any future events that may be occurring you. In fact, Brendan, do you want to come on and, and do a little plug of the of the Instagrams before the final question so they know where to find out about cool events like this in the future? Sure, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I mean, this is a big event for us. This is going to be a reoccurring theme here. Um, and along with Amazon gift cards, they will grow in amount, they will grow in number. Uh, the goal is to get to the top five winners. We'll get Amazon gift cards in the future. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, it's Students of Dentistry, Top Dental Practices, Fall Pre-Dental, Elite Dentist, Stephen Roth, DDS, of course. And everyone here today, thank you again. Let's do this. Let's get this last question. All right. So our last question again, and the only way to make sure that we uh, continue to grow this event and can offer larger and more prizes is to tell everyone how much fun you had tonight, get the word out, and hopefully we'll have even doubled up what we have tonight. And that way we can uh, build an even bigger audience and go from there. So are we ready for the final question of the evening?
Let's check it out. Last one, name that DIF, direct immunofluorescence diagnosis. Is this mucous membrane, pemphigoid, linear IgA disease, pemphigus vulgaris, or lichen planus? DIF, direct immunofluorescence, is a way to look at vesiculoerosive or vesiculobullous conditions. It requires perilesional biopsy or biopsy of tissue next to a lesion to look at it under this special microscope with this special study. What could this be? It is pemphigus vulgaris. So with pemphigus vulgaris, you're going to see a chicken wire like pattern where the antibodies are deposited between the epithelial cells. That's different from mucous membrane pemphigoid, which is going to be at the basement membrane zone and linear IgA disease, which is uh, IgA deposited at the basement membrane zone. Lichen planus isn't so specific, but we can see a shaggy line of fibrinogen. All right, it's the moment of truth. The moment you've all been waiting for. Who is going to get this prize? Who's gonna get this prize? Let's see. Hey, third place, we've got Maddie. In second place, we've got Lena. And in first place, we've got Jill crushed it. Look at this. All right. So Maddie, Lena, Jill, make sure that you fill out that Google Doc that is in the chat. In fact, if everyone could fill out that Google Doc in the chat, just so we know who came in and hung out with us this evening. But these three, make sure you do it so you can get that Amazon gift card. Again, thank you so much for everyone coming out. We had some people that weren't able to play because they got in late, but that's okay. We'll be ready for the next round. Uh, thanks again. We really enjoyed it. We had a lot of fun. And I'll turn it back over to Brendan.